Fear is a funny thing, you know? I was thinking of, if I had to write something down, I was thinking, it was funny, uh, uh, Julie, uh, I, was, I saw Julie over there, and I immediately started thinking of this uh, story when, when the Andersons got together with the Kelsos, and Josh took about, I think we had about three Andersons, maybe three Kelsos out. Uh, late at night, we were uh, hunting, hunting coyote, and uh, we had set up the, we'd set up the predator call uh, in the middle of this field, and, uh, and, I, and so, you know, we had like, there's like six of us, maybe three shotguns, and 15 seconds into the call, I hear this noise immediately behind me. It was just like a, <laughs> and I'm just like, you know, I've heard a lot of cow in my life. That did not sound like a cow. And Josh had the, Josh was sweeping the field with the, uh, with the, the, the light. And he just keeps, I mean, he's just, he doesn't skip a beat. He's just letting it keep scanning. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, <laughs> and then I hear it again. <laughs> and I'm just like, and I'm sitting there thinking like, you know, I'm like double checking. It's loaded. I'm like, where, I, got, I got two of my kids here. Okay. If I get in between them and the vehicle, we're going to be. And so, and so finally he, at, in a moment, he just said, okay, it's a bear. Let's go ahead and head back to the vehicle. Let's make some noise. And so I was like, I immediately felt so relieved. I was like, I thought I lost my man card because I'm thinking like, I don't know what, what's the, you know, what animal that is. We don't have that sound in Florida. Uh, I don't like that sound. I'm not sure. I feel like I should be scared, but I don't want to lose my man card. So I was, I was uh, glad that he responded the way he did. So there, there's my, and that wasn't sinful fear. That was Sanity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies, you guys are doing great. Let's just dive back into First Peter and our last time together in the Word. We're going to look at First Peter chapter five, verses six and seven. First Peter chapter five, verses six and seven. This text is very near and dear to my heart because this text has ministered to me in some very, very profound ways. Let me just read the text and uh, just follow along with me. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, in preparing for the women's conference, I was chatting uh, with the, the pastors at staff meeting last Tuesday, and, and I heard about a very notable women's conference a few years back that uh, they assured me went down in history uh, in some people's minds as the greatest women's conference of all time, in other ladies' minds, the worst of all time. That's the way it was told to me. Sentence diagramming, exactly. You guys, so without further ado, go ahead and cue the uh, next slide. We've got some sweet, sweet sentence diagramming for you ladies. I didn't want anyone to feel, oh, that's, uh, let's see if we can go to the, hopefully. No, maybe not. Like, and I, as, I, as I mentioned to you, this is not Dave's fault. Uh, I, I sent him these, and uh, we, I didn't realize that this was not going to translate between computers. Okay, so... We, had, we don't have it. See, you ladies who were afraid of the sentence diagramming coming up, the Lord delivered you. You were, the Lord, you entrusted yourself to him. You're like, no, not another diagram. And he, he provided. Although that might get fixed before it's all said and done, so don't get too comfortable. Um, all right, Dave, if you, if you get that, then let me know, because I, I don't want to let any, I don't want any woman to be disappointed that they didn't get to see a sentence diagram, so... Um, this passage is very, very simple. It breaks down um, into four simple clauses. And that's what's so helpful about this text. First clause, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That's a command. The next clause, that he may exalt you at the proper time. That's, that's the purpose. That's the purpose of obeying the command. So the command is humble yourself the goal of that purpose, why you do that is so that you let God do the exalting. How do you obey this command? How do you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God? Verse 7, by casting all your anxiety on him. Hey, it's up there. Thank you. Okay, your fears are back. Now you have to repent and you have to confess so that you can enjoy this slide to the glory of God, okay? 
Main statement right there, 6A, that's your command. The, the humble yourselves. Um, and then I indent to the right when something modifies something prior or following. So 6B is farther over because it's modifying 6A, and that's the purpose. 7A, where we're at, casting all your anxiety on him, that's the means of how you obey the, the command to humble yourself. How do you humble yourself? In this context, what Peter's calling us to do is you humble yourself by casting all anxiety, throwing all anxiety on God. And then why do you do that? The reason? Because he cares for you. And literally just paying attention to how these clauses relate to one another unfold the entire argument of this incredibly rich passage. So let's look at this together. In 6a, we start with therefore, and that's actually really important. So this is the one, you know, I'm going to, we're going to spend a lot of time, our entire time just in these two verses, but you do need to read it in context of verses one through five. In light of the fact that, um, Shepherds are called to lead the church, and they're going to give an account to the chief shepherd on the last day, verses 1 through 4, and they need to shepherd willingly, voluntarily, with selfless sacrifice for the sake of the church. And in light of the fact that verse 5 calls the younger men likewise to subject themselves to the elders, and in light of the fact that all Christians, 5b, are called to clothe themselves with humility toward one another, He's about to get to the exhortation that he's going to leave us with. In verse 5, notice that it says, Young men, submit to elders, and all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. That's extremely helpful because Peter shows that submission is one direction. It's not a mutual. There's no such thing as mutual submission. Theologians try to talk about that. that doesn't, that's not even a reality in the Bible. Uh, when it says submit yourselves one to another, it's talking about subjecting yourself, each Christian, to their respective authorities. And then he goes on and gives examples of wives to husbands and parent, children to parents and uh, slaves to masters. But m submission is not mutual. It doesn't go two directions. What does go two directions, and this is sometimes what theologians are trying to get at, and they just use the wrong term, the right reality is mutual humility. When it comes to subordination, there is a, there is a structure, there is a, a subordinating under authority, but when it comes to any individual Christian, we are called to clothe ourselves with humility one toward the other. So there's no such thing as another Christian who is less important than myself. Uh, submission might go one direction, but humility, nope. I am called to look at every single Christian in the church as intrinsically more important than myself. I clothe myself with humility toward them. It doesn't matter if they are 80 years walking with the Lord or they got converted five seconds ago. Uh, clothe yourself with humility one toward another. Why? Verse 5b, because God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And Peter appeals to this axiom. It's a truth going all the way back to Proverbs. Uh, God gives grace to the humble. A humble here is lowly. They are low. They don't think highly of themselves. They don't think highly of their own ability. They don't think highly of their own significance. They don't even really think about themselves. They are low. But the proud or the exalted, so it literally would be like the exalted he's opposed to, the lowly he gives grace to. The exalted, God stands opposed to those. People who um, think highly of themselves, they rely on themselves, they trust in their own assessments, they find themselves at odds with God. God's opposed to them. And because God is opposed to the proud, and because he gives grace to the humble, Peter then gives this charge. So therefore, in light of that, humble yourselves. It flows out of that command, it flows out of that truth, out of that reality. Now, at this point, you're probably asking the question, Okay, that's great, but why in the world are we in a passage on pride when you're talking about killing anxiety? Well, because that is the point. Ladies, if you're going to kill anxiety, you have to kill pride. Uh, it's time to realize, and we have to recognize this, we have to point the finger at ourselves. We have to indict ourselves. If we find ourselves anxious, if we find ourselves worried, we cannot stop short of calling that pride. In verse 6, the command is to humble yourself, and the means of humbling yourself in 7a is 
casting all anxiety on him, if that's the reality, then we cannot say we are humble if we are still anxious. How do you humble yourself? By casting your anxiety on him. So if I'm hanging on to my anxiety, then I, by definition, am not humble. I'm proud. And that's probably old news for many of you. If you've never realized that, then this is such a helpful truth to recognize that my pride is fueling my anxiety. So in 6a, here's the command, humble yourself. It means lower yourself. And sometimes it can be used physically, you know, like a hill being lowered in Luke 3, uh, quoting Isaiah 40, every hill will be brought low, every valley will be raised up. That's a literal use of lower. Most of the time it's metaphorical in the sense of to be humble, to be brought low to cause somebody to lose prestige or status, to humble, humiliate, or abase. That's when you would do it to somebody else, to humble them. Or to cause to be or become humble in attitude, humble or make humble. Now, I have a quote here from John Owen. I want to, is Dave, is that quote coming through? Excellent, thank you. Here's what John Owen said, and this is in his work, The Nature of Apostasy. He's describing how our hearts start to slide toward hardness. And he says this, he says, If the truth at any time be entertained by a soul whose mind is unhumbled and whose affections are unmortified, it is a troublesome inmate and will on the first occasion be parted with. That's so true. Peter tells us here to humble ourselves, and if we don't humble ourselves, then even the truth of this passage is going to become hostile. It's going to become an offense. It's going to become an impossible, troublesome inmate is is, uh, Owen's term. It's like a burr into the saddle. It's just like like something you can't shake, and it's going to start to uh, pry away at the fact that I am not humble if I don't obey this command, and it's going to pry away at my conscience if I'm not um, if, my, if, my, if my anxiety remains. And so, he says in verse 6b, do this, for this with this goal in mind. This is why you would do it. So that he may exalt you at the proper time. The goal? Let God do the exalting. Let God do the exalting. That's the goal. So, ladies, listen, if you want to kill anxiety, you need to put yourself in a position where the only possible way where you would ever end up being exalted is because the Lord has done it, not you. That's what it means to humble yourself and put yourself under his mighty hands to say, there is no possible way I'm taking matters into my own hands to find the exalted position that I'm so desperate for. The only way I'm going to get there is if God puts me there. We have aims and ambitions and desires, especially the ones pertaining to your role in the home and in the church. Ladies, you all have concerns and burdens and fears, and those are part of life. We talked about that with Mary and Martha. The problem is that so often we can become arrogant in in a certain way. We, We start to believe that we can do something to guarantee the outcomes we want in our lives, in our relationships, in with our kids, with how they respond to us, with their future with the husband that God's given to us, or with our elders, and we start taking upon ourselves the burden of bringing things about that we think are desirable. And we need to also think about this term exalted in this way. Don't think when Peter says exalted that he simply means in some sort of base fashion of self-significance. God's not interested in exalting you to a position to get self-significance. So if you, if you read it as self-significance, well, then God's never going to exalt you. Fortunately, God is absolutely committed to glorifying his own name. He's never going to glorify any of us. And we praise God that he's so God-centered. That's not what it means by being exalted. What it means by being exalted means being lifted up out of an undesirable circumstance. Do not take matters into your own hands to try to get those circumstances, you need to humble yourself under God's mighty hand so that if you do find yourself in the desired circumstances, you know that you didn't manipulate it and you weren't idolatrous and you didn't manufacture that outcome. You need to know with a clean conscience, the Lord has done it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
So if you took any of the worries, anxieties, or fears that we've talked about um, this morning or this afternoon, and you take any of those and plug them in there, I mean, it, it's going to work. If you have a desire for your husband to be more active in the church, to lead the family in truth, to blaze a trail and hungering for the Word of God, and to give an example to your children, uh, that's not a wrong desire. What, what's wrong would be to take matters into your own hands and to say, I'm going to bring that about regardless. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Obey. He's given you a means of obedience. He's given you a means of influence. He's given you a path to godliness. He's given you the, a path forward that will always be pleasing to him. He's shown you what will be honorable to him. But you cannot rise up in pride and try to manipulate the circumstances in the way that you desire. If that's the case, then your arrogance has placed you at odds with God, and you have said that you don't need His grace. So, rather than setting yourself at odds with God, humble yourself and resign yourself to the fact that, you know what, if this turns out for good, it's going to be God who did it. Verse 7 then shows us how. The means. Casting every anxiety on him. The uh, NAS here says, uh, casting all your anxiety. The NIV says the same. ASV says the same. King James, all your care. English Standard Version, all your anxieties. And the World English Bible, all your worries. I found that interesting because it's actually a singular. And it should be simply... I mean, I think the best way to accentuate this is an all in the singular is each. Cast each anxiety. Cast each care. And so rather than just viewing it as a qualitative whole, I think it's better, to, I think it's more literal to read it the way Peter wrote it, and that is cast each anxiety, cast each care on the Lord. And so don't impersonalize it and just in this nebulous, just generic worry or concern, but think of each Every concern must be thrown upon God, left in his hand, forsaken there to let him take care of it, to leave it as his burden, to leave it as his means to provide, his opportunity to, to take care of that circumstance. Leave it with him. These cares and concerns are um, things that you might be interested in, and this is, again, not, not um, necessarily sinful cares and concerns. Of course, it becomes sinful if you don't leave it with the Lord. But these are just the normal burdens and cares of life. I will say, um, I, don't, I know we're, we're getting late here, and I don't want to give you a bunch of uh, grammatical details. How are we doing? Should I? Is this okay? Is that good? Just making sure that I'm not giving you feedback here. Um, one, one detail that is helpful about this word care, casting all your care on him, I came across this, this reference where this word is used, and it's used of Jesus. And this is interesting because he, it's describing a cares, cares that he does not have. Um, in Matthew twenty two sixteen, 16, uh, his enemies, his own enemies say this about him. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one. It's translated defer there. That's kind of a strange use of the word because you are not partial to any. And then you start realizing what it is. It's saying that you're not concerned about anyone in any issue. In other words, what people think of you in any area has never been a concern to you. It's describing, his own enemies have to acknowledge that Jesus has no fear of man. He's not concerned in any issue about what people think of him to the degree that what people think of him would ever affect how he acts. And so that's, that's a great use of the word. And so now here, that same word is being used, and Peter's just sitting, sitting there saying, you take every concern, every care, every uh, thing that affects you, and you leave it with the Lord, and you just get busy humbling yourself. Why? Why should I cast all my anxiety on God? Because he cares. I mean, we saw this with Martha, right? Jesus, don't you care? I mean, practically speaking, I know that if Peter, 1 Peter had already been written when Martha was alive, she would have read 1 Peter and said, yep, that's true. But practically speaking, she's not believing that truth. 
Do you believe that truth? Again, I'm not asking you to, whether you believe the statement is true. I know you all agree with that. I'm assuming that we all assent to the truth and veracity of 1 Peter chapter 5, 7b. <laughs> Let's get past that. Not do we believe that it is true. Do we believe that truth? That's a whole different question, isn't it? Perhaps some of the worry or concern that you've been reminded of this morning or this afternoon has brought you to a point where you might have to admit practically that you're not believing that truth. Let me just quickly tell you an anecdote about my own life where I saw this on display. This passage uh, ministered to me in some seriously profound ways. And this is, this is kind of a... a well, it's, it's still, still even a very fresh story in my mind. It's only two years ago. I was um, finishing up my, my, my PhD, and I was studying at a school where it was a, it was a Christian school, and I was writing on an issue that I was convinced would be a topic that was critical for training men, especially this next generation of pastors, in a postmodern environment. I had to fly up to the school for comprehensive exams. Comprehensive exams are a, it's at the end of your um, seminar, your research seminar. So you do research for about three years, and then you have, after your exams, you have about one year of writing a dis dissertation. And so your three years of research are contributing toward this one project. And the transition phase is when you take comprehensive exams. And so I flew up, take, it's a three-day test. You, you, you go to the library at 8 o'clock, and you, you, just bring a, you just bring blank pieces of paper, and there's a manila envelope, and in that manila envelope are three questions, and you have to answer two of the questions in four hours. And if you're not somewhat comprehensive, and if you haven't documented your sources, and you don't even know what the questions are, you're just, you just, you just given this piece of paper, and it could be anything that pertains to anything you've researched in the last three years. And so I sit down... And every day, well, God was so kind. It just was questions that I felt like I knew exactly what needed to be said. And I just was like flying. I'm just, smoke's coming off my fingers. And I'm turning in stacks of papers every single day. And we finish three days of tests. And I was just like, man, glad that's over. I'm moving on with my life. I went home. And I get an email from the director of the, of the, uh, of the, of the department. And um, said, sorry, uh, John, you failed your comprehensive exams. And I looked at the... I looked at the email, I started looking through it, and it said there was one particular day where I failed, and it was day two. So I, I pulled up day two, and I pulled up the response on that particular day. And the way the grading works is there's two professors, and the first person who graded it said, uh, gave, me, gave me the highest marks possible. I, I, and literally, according to this professor's um, understanding, I couldn't have done better. And the second one failed me. And so I had to retake the comprehensive exams because of that. And so I emailed the uh, director and I said, hey, I'm a little confused. You know, I thought, um, can, can we just average these scores and can we all just move on with our lives? And he, he, said, uh, he said, no, John, no, that would ruin the objectivity of the grading. And I'm thinking, objectivity of the grading? You have one professor who said I couldn't do better and you have another professor who said I couldn't do worse. I'm not sure about objective. And the uh, director, who's not even in my department, he's the director of all research doctorates, he's not even in my department, he starts responding to me in this personal email, John, you know, by the way, you, 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 uh, you better learn how to agree with people who disagree with you if you're going to finish this degree. He was the one who was pushing my prospectus through, my proposal, and he actually had been kind of um, put on the shelf for about six months, and he finally started suggesting other other titles, because my title was too definitive. And so he said, if you just call it an argument rather than something like the argument or whatever, you know, just make it an argument, then maybe we'll, you know, maybe it'll go through better. And so I'm, and I've had to, I've, I've sat under this guy, uh, a couple of classes under this guy, and he's pushed back and he's mocked everything that seems like biblical conviction. And I'm literally left with the conclusion, this guy strikes me as a scoffer as defined in Proverbs 1 through 4. And I'm watching him push back. I'm watching how he's grading. I'm watching him bring in people from outside our department who are published in the opposite views that I'm taking on these issues to flunk me in the comprehensive exams. And I'm sitting there and I'm realizing, I see how this is going. 
I'm three and a half years of research into this degree, and it's, it's not going well. And I remember sitting there getting that email, and it was, uh, it was a Friday, and I remember just absolutely being so, so anxious. I was frustrated. I remember thinking, I'm not going to finish this degree. The church has put tens of thousands of dollars into this degree. I've sacrificed ministry time. I've sacrificed family time. And now this isn't even going to turn out. And I'm sitting there thinking like, Lord, aren't I doing this degree for, to help pastors be fit, more faithful? Lord, don't you care? <laughs> it was my Martha moment. I was thinking of all that had been spent and poured into it, both finances and time and sacrifice. Three years of research, all the reading, all the writing that had already gone into it. Here were the thoughts that I found myself thinking. I just took the time to write them out. This is, you know, this is uh, humble, terrifying, and very needful. God, this kind of unbelieving ideology should not be imposed on your word at a professing evangelical school let alone should you intolerate the injustice I'm receiving. God, don't let all this work, time, ministry, sacrifice, and money be wasted. This is a waste if I don't get the degree. If you've determined that I would not receive this degree after all of this, then you must not care about my sacrifices. So here's what that revealed about my theology. My theology was on display and again, before this moment, I don't think I would have ever imagined these things being resident in my heart. I was practically believing, God, you've made a mistake. You don't know what you're doing, and you don't care about me unless I finish this project with a degree. Wouldn't you know that with that kind of unbelief in my heart, I could stare straight at 1 Peter 5, 7b and no, I'm not believing it. I remember looking at that verse and just saying, I know it's true. I, I, I know it's true. And right now, I am clearly struggling to believe it because in my mind, I cannot justify all of this for what I think should be the payoff. Here's what I had to believe in order to cast off this anxiety and to leave it at God's feet. God, you know what is best. The fact that I'm anxious right now proves that I have not humbled myself under your mighty hand. The fact that I'm more anxious about this circumstance than, I'm convicted, than I am convicted about my pride reveals how backward my priorities are. And Lord, forgive me for even imagining that you did not care about me I know you do in the word, but I have practically failed to believe that. Help my unbelief. I know that you know best how to glorify your name and build your own church. Forgive me for thinking that I knew better. Listen, ladies. I had to come to a point. I remember, I distinctly remember this. I had to actually pray, Lord, make me infinitely more sensitive to my pride than to an academic injustice. See, I actually was so arrogant that I thought I would knew, know better what was going to be useful for the kingdom. And it wasn't until I repented of that kind of arrogance that I ever started to break the back on anxiety. I had to literally preach to myself, Lord, you you know what's best for your church. You know what's best for your kingdom. You know what's best for me and my family, not me. You can use me with or without a degree, but you cannot use me with pride. That has to go. Lord, don't let up until I'm more sensitive to my pride against you than being unjustly treated. Ladies, maybe you're thinking about some of these areas where you're anxious. And it's probably even helpful to think about some of those categories, the ones that are particularly challenging for you, the particularly acute ones that are very prone to bring back that flood of anxiety. 
and to start to evaluate it in the light of this passage. To ask, have you actually humbled yourself under God's mighty hand? Have you actually put yourself there to say, where I had to literally say, I don't know how this is going to go. I'm just going to keep moving forward and keep doing what I believe honors the Lord. I don't even know if I'm going to get a degree. I don't know if I'm going to get kicked out of the program. I don't know what's going to happen. It, I might get kicked out of a program just simply for evangelical convictions. That's okay. Well, let's leave that with the Lord's hand. I had to humble myself until there was no way forward. If it was going to happen, it had to be the Lord doing it. And that was the only way to kill anxiety in my life. And until I got to the point where I repented of doubting 7b, I could not have come to the conclusion that if three and a half years of effort turned into nothing, that that actually might be God's best for me. And so in those areas where you're particularly acute to be anxious, and there's a real fear there, and you know this would be the worst circumstances, according to my own wisdom. Ladies, that's where you have to say, but if it's God's best, I know he cares. That's the only way to kill anxiety. About that time, I had a friend send me a quote from John Newton. John Newton, you know, was the famous pastor, former slave trader, wrote Amazing Grace. He was a pastor in, in London in the 1800s. He had a friend named John Rylands Jr. John Ryland Jr. was a young man. John Ryland was a pastor. He was in the ministry. And when he wrote this letter, he was responding to John Ryland, who wrote to John Newton about his romantic pursuit that had recently turned to dust. So it did not turn out well. He was very sad about it. Uh, and so John Newton wrote as the older man to encourage John Ryland. And it was just an incredible letter. He was just saying, Basically, why are you so worried about it? You sound like you're not trusting the Lord in this. And he just said, you know, God saved you and he's called you into the ministry to do more than to, uh, you know, tie yourself around a woman's apron strings. I think that's how he put it at the beginning of the letter. It's pretty blunt. They obviously had a pretty tight relationship. But the portion of the letter that I wanted to read to you ladies, it's right here. It's on the, it's on the PowerPoint so you can follow along. In this section, he starts to explain why God often brings you to the point where you have let go on the thing that you want, even, even, watch this, even if it's God's will to give it to you. John Newton writes this, worldly people expect their schemes to run upon all fours, as we say. So he's just talking about, it's just like they expect it to just go along. Here's my plan. It should go off without a hitch. We'll just move forward, and it can be effective and productive, and we'll just get there. Great. And they expect that, and the objects of their wishes to drop into their mouths without difficulty. And if they succeed, they, of course, burn incense to their own drag, and not, that requires some explanation. That's, a, that's like an old English way of saying, it's kind of a reference, honestly, to Habakkuk, where the fishermen um, have drag nets. And so it was like a superstitious thing. Here's the idea. If a fisherman goes out and on, you know, Tuesday, man, he just nails it and he brings, he brings home serious paycheck because he brought in so many fish and then Wednesday was bad, Thursday was bad. He's like, now which net did I use on Tuesday? So on Friday, he goes back to Tuesday's net. It's like superstition, right? And then he gets a big catch of that one. It's like, this is my net, man. This is the one. And, and so it's kind of like this superstitious thing about how to guarantee success. And so that's what he's appealing to. It's like, when it goes well, you're going to burn incense to your own drag. You're going to say, I have found the way forward to guarantee the outcome that I want. That's what he's getting at here. And say, this was my doing. But believers meet with rubs and disappointments, which convince them that if they obtain anything, it is the Lord must do it for them. For this reason, I observe that he usually brings a death upon our prospects, even when it is his purpose to give us success in the issue. That is a profound statement. That is so wise. Ladies, that's quite often the way it is with the Lord. He quite often brings death to your ambitions, especially if he plans to give it to you. Because what would happen if he just gave it to you without the death of that ambition? You'd say, yeah, I did it. I got the degree. <laughs> Whereas, I know better. God gave me that degree. 
Ladies, when you believe that God cares for you, you'll know it because you'll be able to rise up with true thanks in your heart for the circumstances that are killing the object of your ambition. And at that point, you'll be able to thank the Lord because you know that God knows best. This is why anxiety is fueled by pride. Anxiety will never die while pride remains intact. And we have to think about this biblically, ladies. And so when we, kill, when we deal death blows to our pride and we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, you will see anxiety die the death of the gospel, killing that sin in your heart. Because you'll believe God knows better. I'm humbling myself under his hands. If this is to succeed, it has to be him to do the exalting. And I'm going to leave all of those concerns with him, the only safe place to put them. I don't want to dare trade. That's above my pay grade. I'm getting out. I'm just going to go back to believing that God knows what's best. He cares for me. Lord, we're just so thankful for this day. We've had such a sweet time in your word and so thankful for the attentiveness of these ladies. I know that um, this time has been sweet. The fellowship has been in incredible and the time in your word has been just so needed. Um, and, and now, Lord, as we uh, have opportunity to, to, to sing your praises one more time before we head home and, and these ladies return back to responsibilities and, and uh, other, other uh, demands, I just pray that your truth would continue ministering to them, strengthen them by faith to be encouraged uh, as they deal death blows to anxiety and fear. Uh, Lord, we're just so thankful. Thankful for how you work in, on our behalf. Thankful for how you glorify your name in us and through us. Thankful for how you guarantee that you'll never let us be in a position where we would exalt ourselves. So, Lord, we want to humble ourselves and let you, do, let you be the only one who's attempting to do any exalting. Um, thank you for caring for us. Even, Lord, it's, it's so hard to even go back and address these things rightly. Even when we complained against you while you were caring for us. You are so kind. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.